Greetings, and welcome to Cyber Focus, your source for international business information. My name is Rose Mason, and our guest today is Terry Mugen. Terry is a professor at the University of Victoria, specializing in cross-cultural competence and SMEs, small and medium-sized businesses. He is a graduate of the University of Lancaster and the founding chair of the International Society for Intercultural Education, Training and Research. Terry has led a number of projects funded by the UK government, the European Commission, and the OECD. In addition to co-authoring a paper titled Strategic Ethnography and Reinvigorating Tesco PLC, Terry has done significant research on SMEs in the international business world. On this topic, he has co-authored a paper titled Strategies for Internationalization Within SMEs, The Key Role of the Strategic Leader and the Internationalization Web. Terry, thank you for joining us today. It's a pleasure. First, could you tell us a little bit about SMEs and how you got interested in them? Uh, yes, it was quite late in life, I suppose. Uh, nobody in my family was in business. Mm -hmm. we, we were all in education. Uh, so I went into teaching and I taught what I enjoyed most, which was foreign languages. Mm -hmm. So when I got my first or second job, which was in a college in the UK, in a place called Aylesbury, um, part of the college's brief was to provide language training for local companies. So I was teaching full-time students, but I was also going, going out in the mornings and in the evenings and sometimes at lunch times to, to teach uh, French or German to companies which were either already exporting there or were thinking of going, going in that direction. Mm -hmm. So going into these small companies, just a few people, uh, and you'd gather around a desk, four or five of you, very enthusiastic people. It was a great introduction to understanding what kind of organizations they are and, and what keeps them going, what makes them tick. Great, thank you. Um, now, could you explain how the internationalization process affects SMEs? Uh, sometimes it's in their control, sometimes it's out of their control or largely out of their control. Mm -hmm. uh, some SMEs decide to go international because they have some personal reason for it. Sometimes a member of the, uh, the, the owner manager, the managing director, or somebody important in the SME mm -hmm. uh, has a desire to make contact with a country, with somebody they've met there, or they've come up with some kind of link that, that they think it would be a good idea to pursue. Uh, sometimes at the other end of the scale, it it's, can be out of their control. If they, for example, supply parts to a larger company or some kind of component or service to larger companies, sometimes that larger company can pull the SME into mm -hmm. international markets. On other occasion, in the old days, it would be a letter dropping through the letterbox and containing an order. Nowadays, that's much more likely to happen on the web, on the internet. Uh, so it's very random. There's, there's no one way in which it happens. As I said, sometimes deliberate, sometimes just accidental. Oh, okay. Very interesting. Now, you mentioned the owner-manager. Um, what are some of the problems that they have in overseas markets, and are there any solutions? Yes, the owner-manager, uh, as you said, very, very often they're, they're, they're people with a strong... Sometimes these, these uh, individuals are called entrepreneurs. Mm -hmm. In quite a lot of the academic literature, they may be called entrepreneurs. Um, they tend to be people with a very strong sense of what it is they're doing and why they want to do it and what their background is. And um, So the decision to go international it will very, very often come from something within their own character or their own personal experience too. So as I said, it can be something on a, they enjoy going on holiday to a place. Mm -hmm. It's very, very often very whimsical, um, but sometimes it, it comes from something deeper. Um, quite a lot of, in manufacturing companies, for example, or in companies which, um, which employ, which, which require a high degree of crafts or trades, skills, qualifications, you'll sometimes find that the owner manager or somebody important in the company has had international experience, uh, maybe working for another company or working for a company in a particular market earlier in their career. 
the, 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 the owner manager will, will do this largely based on whether it feels right or not. Okay. And if it feels right, they'll usually do it. I say they, he or she will usually do it. And then they face up to the consequences of it. Mm -hmm. And that's when the really hard work starts. I see. So are there any factors of success for them entering the overseas market, even though they come from such different backgrounds and why they want to do it? Yeah, the success factors are a commitment, first and foremost. It's, um, it's something that involves a shock for the company mm -hmm. uh, in terms of what it upsets the company's usual routines. Mm -hmm. uh, people find themselves having to deal with, with factors that, and partners that they know very little about. Most SMEs grow and emerge on the basis of knowing a local market very, very well. Mm -hmm. And, um, and when, they, when they're faced with a foreign market mm -hmm. about which they've learned, they've heard, they may maybe have heard one or two things, they'll have encountered maybe one or two individuals who've described that market to them or who've made them, tried to make them interested in that market. Uh, they do so with, uh, with a lot of trepidation. Mm -hmm. um, so really the most important thing that SMEs need in this respect is access to information. And that's all kinds of information. And that information can obviously offset some of the trepidation, some of the fears they have. Um, the next level that they need to explore is, is the, the concept of proximity, trying to get closer to the market, and that's best done through people. It's best done through visiting the markets. It's best done by taking part in trade visits with other companies so that you can compare your experience with other entrepreneurs who are having similar thoughts, even if they're from a different sector. You'll learn a lot. Uh, the next big step is the, in most cases, if you start off exporting, will be by appointing a distributor of some kind, an agent or a distributor. And that, once again, is a, is a personal decision made by the owner manager usually and which involves a leap of faith um, very very often they will in a similar similar to what i've said about the earlier stages they will select the agent or distributor on a pretty unstrategic basis mm -hmm. um, they start making some small mistakes of course we all do and as you hear from the stories of entrepreneurs in silicon valley making mistakes has turned into a is turning into a into a real virtue nowadays, provided you've got the networks of people to discuss it with. So making one or two mistakes at the earlier stages is a good thing. Choosing a distributor is very, very important. Um, they can either make or break you in that market. Sometimes they, the entrepreneur, the owner manager doesn't do enough research and they have to deal with the consequences of that by having a contract that they want to get out of or finding that a distributor isn't representing them to the extent and with the same energy that they thought they would or finding out the, the, the distributor also distributed similar products from a competitor the, that you know and uh, that wasn't clear to you at the time. So getting the contract right, getting the agreement right, getting the right understanding with those people who are so important to you in the market, those things are important. As this process rolls out, of course, the Every, we all learn to avoid our mistakes and you referred to the I think to the article earlier on about the owner manager and we we talk about it as a strategic process because if the if the actions if the decisions didn't start off by being strategic ie based on sound research and understanding of the competition understanding of the environment uh, they pretty quickly become that way and uh, the owner manager grows in confidence uh, about dealing with a particular market uh, they learn some of the language mm -hmm. and that helps a lot uh, and it helps a lot more when they learn more of the language uh, and they become somebody who is really uh, close to the concept of what you'd call the international manager mm -hmm. the main difference is that, that he, the owner manager doesn't have the large corporation, large organization behind them. And sometimes they overlook the need to bring everybody else in the company, in the small firm, up to speed with mm -hmm. decisions they've made, commitments they've made, uh, and an understanding of what the consequences of those commitments are. Wow. 
So yes, they then have to go out and find out, find people who can help them do those things. It definitely seems like the managers face a lot of different problems, very different from the larger firms. Mm, indeed. Yeah, and very often feeling on your own is, is the toughest part. Yeah, because in the foreign market. Because they have to be authoritative in the company that they're running. Mm -hmm. And even if they're not sure that they've done the right thing or they've got the preparation right, they obviously have to push it through. Right, right. Thank you. Um, on top of that, in your paper, Strategies for Internationalization Within SMEs, there's a discussion on the two phases of policy development. Could you walk us through that a little bit? Yeah, I think that what we were talking about there was with regard to policy development related mm -hmm. to the environment of the owner manager. Okay. Um, SMEs export for another reason that I didn't mention at the beginning, and that's because governments want them to export because when, mm -hmm. when SMEs export, they obviously bring foreign revenues to the country in which they're based and um, and that is good for the economy of the home country. Uh, it's generally acknowledged within economic theory that the markets contain some imperfections uh, and it's because of the imperfect market theory that in spite of policy that's emerged in the last 20-30 years to increase competition, mm -hmm. it's acknowledged that SMEs suffer from imperfect markets to a greater degree than large companies do. So policy is the process by which governments can help SMEs achieve the object of exporting and help them uh, through a certain number of steps in, 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 the, in the phases of, of growth that they have. So. Back when we wrote the article, we were thinking about policy primarily in the area of exporting. Okay. It's become much more complex since then because obviously uh, the internet has, has grown and access to the information that we're talking about has, has, um, has improved. So what the phases of policy development have become more complex, uh, not least because governments have become more complex and governments have sought to help companies do other things apart from export to mm -hmm. help them to innovate, for example. But the basic phases of policy development, which are basically research and consultation, mm -hmm. still apply. And I think it's an important factor that all business schools should be more involved in, in, in advising governments on the relevant research to look at when they're devising policy to 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 use with small companies um, whether they need what kinds of help they need whether it's just information or whether it's um, help with other factors such as networking and um, finance etc so I think business schools can get involved in that policy phase more actively than many are uh, particularly on a regional level because a lot of these a lot of these policies are enacted regionally nowadays and, uh, and then obviously help uh, where necessary as well with consultation processes because business schools have access to large numbers of companies that either are SMEs or, or have SMEs in their supply chain. So the, 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 the basic policy structure is similar, but I think that the opportunities for SMEs to work with business schools as part of the process of policy development has got greater, if anything. Thank you. So, in spite of the difficulties that SMEs face in imperfect markets, how do you see the future of SMEs in the international business market? Yes, it's it's obviously there is the future is more complex because there are more markets that are now open to SMEs than were the case. We all know about the brick economies, and we all know about emerging other economies which are emerging in uh, across the world. So the, the, the span between advanced economies and emerging economies with lesser technological resources is, is now greater than ever was and there's probably more space for SMEs which have got the kind of qualities that we're talking about to, to find a place mm -hmm. in there. So an SME, some of the SMEs that we worked with in, in the east of England, for example, quite a lot of them were, were very active in Europe and very concentrated very much on uh, Northern Europe and Scandinavia because levels of technology and levels of consumer demand were very similar to to those in, in the UK. Uh, but really, m 
other companies which are newer to those markets, newer, newer to international markets, uh, would probably not be advised to go straight into those kinds of competitive environments in, in the first place. If they can find somewhere where they can gear up the company more gradually whilst learning, whilst um, ge generating revenues and making the exporting activity worthwhile for everybody in the company. Right, right. Thank you. Is there anything else that you would like to add? Not really. My normal, um, the, the, the main outcome of the study and one or two others that we carried out over the time period that, the, that you referred to mm -hmm. was that the companies that get most support from SMEs are first time, first market entry mm -hmm. companies. So um, basically at the very, very early stage. The company may be quite well established, but most, most governments provide support for the first foreign market entry. Our study actually discovered that companies carried on needing support, albeit of different kinds, for the next three, five, seven years. Um, and really not enough governments and countries are willing to kind of take responsibility for the, for the subsequent stages, well, either subsequent stages of entering ex further markets or finding other ways of, of, of trading internationally. And so I think that the, the experience of business schools in, in having that dialogue with government and having a more involved dialogue with the local economy mm -hmm. could maybe be a, a resource that those medium-sized companies could turn to because, um, because they can't afford to pay for management consultants, right. but they do, need, they do need help. Oh, great. Well, thank you so much for taking the time to speak with us today. Okay, it's a pleasure. Thank you. Thank you. And thanks to the Vincent and Eleanor Ostrom Workshop in Political Theory and Policy Analysis for bringing Terry to campus. That's all for this edition of Cyber Focus. If you have any comments or suggestions for future topics, please contact us at ciber at indiana.edu.